Okay, this is the next session of our course on computational GABA analysis, um, November 26. And uh, I will show you a few things, uh, to some extent material related to the way how we do MATLAB, uh, and the other one more related to GABOR. You will see a few things maybe several times or so. So it's like walk, walking through a town and seeing interesting objects. And after a while, you see the same object from another side. So I'm not, I didn't go for minimality of the presentation. And also it's mixed between MATLAB tools and which I usually will call now DEM, NUHAC, and with some number and more uh, GABOR related things, which I call GABOR DEM, uh, also with a running increasing number. So one of the tools uh, that I was using or I'm using uh, quite a few times uh, is my command row call. So sometimes you have to describe points in the matrix or positions in the matrix by row and column number. And sometimes you describe it by the running. So for example, if you create a irregular GABOR family, I would say you have you put ones somewhere in the matrix and if you read them out then it's a particular order you go through the column number one two three and so on just to illustrate this there are two commands in standard matlab meanwhile one is called int to sub and the other is the opposite which is sub to int uh, and i just demonstrate it very quickly if i start with a zero matrix of size five so u is zeros of size five and I put at position 17 a one and of course if I'm asking where is there a one uh, you could also uh, maybe say I put also at position u at 20 also put a one or maybe I put uh, uh, I don't know point zero and I run this same section once more. Then you see the find command is telling me that in the matrix going through the 25 positions of a five by five matrix, I have found something non zero. Uh, also, you could even have an imaginary part. So if it's I times something, you find something non zero here. Uh, so if you have a, done a computation, you might find uh, a value of zero which is almost zero but not exactly zero and it, it would still find uh, this the, this find command would find everything which were kind of the storage is not uh, uh, the original one now the int to sub command has two output commands and it just tells you well we find um, these elements in row number two and the second one in row number five and in column number four if you think of uh, the numbers 20, 17 and 20, of course, you fill first three columns, which is from one to five, six to 10 and so on. And of course, they are all in the fourth column. That's why the column number is four in each time, but it's at, in row number two and in row number uh, five. And the row call command is doing the same thing. And of course, you have to tell uh, the routine what is the size that you expect? Because you might have only few things in a seven by seven or a five by five matrix. And so that's the only difference. The int to sub uses the format information at the first position we use in the second position. Now, another thing uh, uh, which is already going into the direction of time frequency analysis is uh, that we want to understand the time frequency uh, shift operators. So in the terminology of uh, Charlie's book, uh, Charlie Grechenick's book, these are the pi lambda. And if lambda has a time parameter and the frequency parameter, then uh, we have it here as the first and the second input. So I take some random numbers. I choose something which is not the divisor of our signal length, 480. And so I'm creating a time frequency matrix uh, remember, I'm using row mode. That means I'm doing right matrix multiplication. And um, then, of course, um, if I say, well, give me the spreading representation, and we will talk a lot about the spreading representation of matrices, then essentially it says, well, tell me how to 
describe this um, this matrix, this time frequency shift matrix, as a linear combination of all possible. And your answer will be, well, I just need that one on the right one. And uh, so I just want to demonstrate that um, one feature of this math to spread routine is that I'm saying, well, let's take this expansion and then find where this is uh, non-trivial. I mean, uh, you can check also where it's larger than 1000 time epsilon and you can make it even smaller and you find there is exactly one position. And uh, if you look at this, the two parameters that I was using for the input was 7 and 13. Uh, I'm not showing the full matrix because it would be much bigger. It would be 408 by 480. I'm showing only the segment from number one to number 20 in both horizontal and vertical direction. And if you look here, you will see it's number eight here and number 14 here. Uh, now, uh, why do we have number 13? Well, the frequency shift is the coded as up and down. And remember that the first row corresponds to zero frequency. Therefore, if I am making a frequency shift of 13, it should be 13 below the first row, which is, of course, 14. And horizontal direction, we go start with zero, that's the label. Uh, but we have one, two, three, and we should eight is seven to the right. So it's true. And of course, uh, if I do now the command of converting into rows and column, I, you see what I'm seeing in the picture. It's exactly row number 14, column number eight. And therefore, you can compute uh, that this was the contribution. You reduce this number by one and everything is fine. Now, the other way to, um, if you have essentially a basis, uh, the way to show what the basis vectors are for this routine is you could say, well, I put now, uh, now a different one, I put now uh, in a zero matrix of size n, and now I'm working in the spreading domain, in the coefficient domain, at position 12 and 17, I put a one. So I'm saying, well, if I have only one element of my basis, and then I do the conversion, in the conversion, the opposite of make a spreading function, give me the spreading coefficients from the matrix is, of course, spread to mat. Uh, so given the spreading coefficients, now a single coefficient converted to the corresponding matrix of the matrix W. And to be sure that it's an n by n matrix, uh, it will probably work without the n. Uh, but uh, And then the question is, is this the correct time frequency matrix? Now we expect to get a matrix of size n, uh, but we have to think here we are saying that we have row number 11 and row is up and down and 11, uh, pardon, row number 12. And this is 11 below the first one. So it should be a frequency shift of 11. And uh, we should have column number 17, which is 16 to the right so it's a time shift of 16. And if you see the experiment, everything works fine. So this is exactly the correspondence. In the spreading representation, you see the contribution of each of these time frequency shifts, and they are an autonomous basis. Now, uh, a completely different thing uh, is, um, is uh, this command here, um, just showing you some other routine. If you say, well, there is a command in MATLAB called the DCT, the two-dimensional discrete cosine transform. And then somewhere you may read, yes, this is a, this is a, a orthogonal expansion of images. Actually, this is at the basis of JPEG. So the JPEG algorithm says, well, if you give me a gray level image, then I can decompose it into blocks of size eight by eight. Each block is therefore a member of a 64 dimensional space of pixel images. And we use a standard basis. And the standard basis 
uh, has these elements. Now, how do I get these elements? And that's maybe more useful than, than the story here is I'm saying, well, I create on the transform domain, again, a zero matrix now as size eight. I'm showing you the first few so that it's better visible. I'm putting a one at position uh, J, J and K, K. You see, I'm trying to avoid the letter J as a running index because engineers like to use J as square root of minus one, so the imaginary unit. So I always use running indices, which are double letters. That's a kind of a recommendation even. And then I'm saying, well, I go to the subplot with the corresponding number. So it's nine pictures. Uh, and uh, I have a running index. I start with the first one. Each time I create a new position, I'm going to the next one. And I'm um, showing you this picture. Now, uh, you get these funny, nice pictures. But they are rectangular and they are supposed to be uh, square images and therefore I'm doing now for all these nine subplots and I could do it, of course, each time I apply the column map and I want to have gray level images and I also apply this axis square command. So this do all is a very useful private comment, a, a private routine that allows to say, well, if I have a multiple uh, a, a, a plot or an image with several uh, plotting windows and I want to apply the same command to this to all the windows uh, then I just do it once and you see here the first coefficient in the DCT two-dimensional DCT component or the first JPEG coefficients is just the average gray level so this should be constant one these numbers here uh, to the right and to the left uh, are organized such that they show you it's more dark to the right or to the left. So with these three, you can say, well, I can show you a little bit that this is a picture which is a little bit more uh, dark on the left and to the right. Now, uh, there is a natural order to say if I'm giving you only the first, oops, the first, uh, let's say, uh, six uh, JPEG coefficients, then you would get these in the following order. One, I'm not sure if you go up and down, but it's a zigzag curve, like the piano counting. So it would be maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you would go on with this higher. You can imagine if you go to the last one, that's the most oscillating part. So of course, if you do JPEG compression, you might not see the position of some hairs in the face of a person that you are taking a photograph, but you see all the details if you have this. So that's kind of just telling you if you have any orthogonal trends or uh, basis mapping, the inverse mapping allows you to look at the building blocks. That, that's all I want to say. Now, uh, another thing that uh, I want to demonstrate here is that um, if you multiply with the diagonal matrix from the left and from the right, you can do it equally by multiplying with a so-called tensor product. I will show you directly what it is. So the demonstration is just, you see there is something which is numerically equals zero. So the, I'm doing two different things on a random five by five matrix. So what, what are these? Well, I'm creating complex numbers. It's not important that they are now normalized, but the vector um, D1 and the vector D2, they are two vectors of size five, and this is a five by five matrix. And of course, the diagonal command gives you the diagonal matrices. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm multiplying from the left and from the right with the diagonal matrix. And uh, what, what this shows, because it's the same, I can also take the column vector D1 prime. So that's the transpose conjugate. And then you multiply it with the vector D2. Now, recall that if I have column vectors D1 and D2, this would be the scalar product. Actually, it would be this color product of D2 with D1 
if I would have column vectors. Why? Because uh, the D1 is put into row mode, but now we have row vectors. So this is now a n by one column vector. And the other one is a one by n uh, row vector. So the product of these two vectors is a matrix of size five by five. Therefore, it is meaningful to say, I can, of course, I can multiply with the diagonal matrix. That's a product of five times five times five matrices, or I can create another five times five matrix by doing a table multiplication with the conjugate of the entries of the, of the first vector and the other one here. So remember, um, if you do it, if you write a tensor product of, of maybe two functions, f with g, you're getting a function of the product domain, which is a function of x and y. And you would say, well, I'm doing f of x times g of y. And that's what we do here, actually. So that's, and it's just a test, which you can verify on paper, of course. But uh, now the point is, uh, why I'm doing this is, if I would do now, uh, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm showing you directly. I want to show you what happens with the matrix. And I'm taking uh, this uh, Fourier matrix now. And I'm saying, well, what happens if I multiply or I conjugate my, my matrix um, with, with any matrix, n by n matrix x, different ones, different dimension now, with a pure frequency. And conjugating means I'm multiplying. Uh, yeah, I should, of course, say. What happens if you're applying a diagonal matrix to another matrix from the left? Well, acting with any matrix from the left means you're doing column-wise multiplication. So you're doing a column-wise multiplication with the entries of the first diagonal matrix. And from the right, of course, you're doing the same thing in the row-wise. So multiplying, and that's now the, the story, with some pure frequency, and I'm choosing frequency number 15. Frequency number 15 is found as the entry number. Um, uh, maybe I'm, I'm also doing this here. Uh, I'm showing you that, of course, the matrix, the Fourier matrix is symmetric. No, I could have taken columns at the same time, but so this is now a, a row vector, but I could have taken uh, column number 16. So you see the comp norm routine requires only the same Euclidean dimension. And now I'm running this to get, yes, these row and columns are not identically, but numerically identical. And then I'm doing uh, the, the diagonal matrix and I could say, well, we are multiplying with the pure frequency from the left and from the right. And uh, of course, I should tell you that I was choosing 16, which means frequency number 15, because 15 is a divisor of, uh, of n. So maybe I should also remind you why I'm not choosing, I don't know, 14 or so, because that would be 13. It's clearly a divisor of our n. And therefore, uh, I can ask, well, what is now, what are the matrices which are, oh, sorry, here. Yeah. What happens if I conjugate with any matrix with a, a pure frequency multiplication operator? And of course, this has to be unchanged. So um, if I'm saying this D20, I mean, this yeah, DF20, actually, this is nonsense. It should be DF16 uh, uh, or so. Yeah, I, I didn't actually carry it out. Uh, maybe I should say uh, we commute, we have a commutation with the pure frequency 15 or so would be exactly the diagonal matrix. So we can say that we just have to see we multiply with one uh, and it doesn't change. But if we would have any entry which is non-zero, then um, the matrix cannot be invariant. 
So I'm essentially I'm trying to demonstrate to you what is the shape of any matrix which is commuting with the multiplication with the pure frequency 15 in our example. And so I'm just saying, well, because I have demonstrated that this multiplication or conjugation with such a frequency shift matrix is nothing else but a pointwise multiplication. And then I have to look where this pointwise multiplier, in our case now, it's uh, here, it's F16 prime with this is practically numerically equal to one. And then you see something nice. If I do start a new figure, then I see that you have this pattern. And of course you can ask yourself, what is, uh, how many, uh, I mean, everything is sitting on side diagonals, so to say, that's the message. And uh, you can also say, how many side diagonals do we have? And I would say, uh, if we count here, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, 13, 14, 15. So you can say uh, that uh, note commutation with pure frequency shift shift uh, 15 gives just 15 cyclic uh, side diagonals. You remember that uh, this is something quite interesting. Now, not really uh, continuous, but because I have already started to dem use this demo file, I would also show something to you which is we have now two or at the end four different representations of, a, of, a, of an operator. And I would like to show you what happens if this operator is the projection operator on the Gauss function. So here on the side, maybe I just recall you, uh, the norm of my discrete Gauss function is one. And uh, it's made such that it looks like a Gauss function, of course, in a discrete way. And it's F of T invariant if you take the unitary version of the free transform. So uh, what is uh, the projection on a Gauss function? Well, you take first a scalar product with a Gauss function. But uh, in our case, you can say, well, I have a row vector. So therefore, therefore, this G prime, it's the conjugate of a real valued function is just turning it in the column vector and then you are synthesizing it. So you are getting nothing else but a two-dimensional uh, Gauss function. So that's an interesting observation and it's extremely well concentrated. So what I'm doing here is I'm showing you the matrix, but you see only a segment because later on I was doing it all these four representations assume by a factor of four and I was plotting the axis. You remember the image C command puts the tails into the center. So there's a lot of things happening in the background, but these images should be um, self-explaining. Now, if you are having a representation of a matrix, you can also ask what is the representation of the operator in the Fourier basis? And in order to do so, you conjugate your operator with the Fourier transform. So maybe we should also do this. Um, and uh, that means you're saying uh, comp norm PGG, the projection operator. And now we are doing uh, F prime with PGG uh, with F. And we check. Maybe we do it in the opposite order. And uh, yeah, maybe it's better if I make a section break so that I only have to run uh, this number. Uh, okay, there's a type, of course. And uh, here you see that up to the normalization, which is 
we should have taken the unitary version of the free transform. So maybe I correct now and say uh, f u is f f t u of n. This is a private command, but it's just f f t of i of n. So it's the matrix divided by square root of n. And because this is done twice, it should be now exactly what we want to have. Let me see. Yeah, and you see now it's, it's perfect. But uh, on the other hand, uh, this is for any matrix, the multiplication from left and right means you're doing uh, row wise, column wise. So it's essentially the two dimensional Fourier transform while well, maybe some flip operator applied, but the two dimensional tensor uh, product, the two dimensional Fourier transform of the tensor product can be done coordinate wise, but coordinate wise with Gauss function and they are invariant. So uh, yeah, so maybe I should also say this. Uh, comp um, FFTU, oh, sorry, FFTU of G. So this is FFT divided by square root of N and G. And this is also demonstrating that the one dimensional unitary Fourier transform is leaving the Gauss function invariant, therefore this is invariant. Therefore, if you show the matrix in standard representation or in the Fourier basis, this is exactly the same matrix. Now, if it's very interesting, and we have already mentioned the spreading representation, if you do the spreading representation, you see something which is wider than this here. And uh, if you take the Kuhn-Nirnberg symbol, and these two are related by the symplectic Fourier transform, then uh, you see that there is a widening or so. So what it also tells you is that, well, symplectic Fourier transform is forward and inverse Fourier transform, so there's some rescaling going on, um, but a Gauss function should go to a Gauss function. So how can it be that you are getting some function here? A uh, broader Gauss function, why are not, they not equal? And the answer is, well, here we are demonstrating only the absolute value of the spreading domain. So actually the spreading domain is act, can for the Gauss function of, of a projection operator is essentially the square root of a Gauss function, but with some additional phase factors, but they disappear in this plot or in this representation. So that, that's why we should see it here. Now, uh, uh, here I'm, I'm doing a few, a few other things, uh, namely demonstrating that uh, the two-dimensional free transform of this projection operator is up to normalization the same. That's more or less what I did before. If I look at the Kuhn-Nirnberg symbol, it looks the same, but it doesn't work. If I compare it, it's not the same. But if I normalize it properly and I take the absolute value, then it's exact. So the absolute value of this, so the plot are really the same. And I'm doing the same thing now for the uh, spreading function. So it's really the square root of a Gauss function is a more flat Gauss function. And this is in at least the absolute value normalized properly. I was playing around a little bit and actually I, I'm not sure about the factor that you have here, but uh, roughly speaking, uh, you can do it. Okay. Uh, final step is uh, very important also for the understanding of, of why the short term free transform and the um, spreading function are uh, closely uh, connected. If I take again row vectors and now they are not Gaussian anymore, I mean, because I want to sh demonstrate things which might depend on the Fourier invariance or the positivity or the symmetry of the Gauss function. So what's coming next is should be independent and um, demonstrate that this is something that should work. So the first thing is I want to describe the rank one operator um, arising from, from um, these two random vectors. So recall, we are living in Cn, 
or if you want, an L2 space over the cyclic group of order n, but now it's just vector and a linear algebra. And so how do you get a, a, a mapping which has a range which is one dimensional? Well, you choose the directional vector G2 in the range space and you can normalize it so then it's a unit vector. And then you're saying, well, but the coefficients are picked up by some linear functional. And we know the dual space of our Rn or Cn is Cn as a row vectors. So you take scalar products. So if somebody is coming, remind yourself, we are in the row mode. Somebody is coming with an element of Cn, which is a row vector. First, you have to take scalar product with G1, and then you do this. If you're studying quantum analysis or so, you might say there are bras and cats. And uh, so I'm taking brackets and these are cat and bras and so on. But now the interesting thing is if you take these normalized vectors and you ask what is the operator norm um, of this matrix, you can take uh, no, the, the Frobenius norm, um, uh, but I think you can also take the operator norm uh yeah, maybe we try it here what is the norm of p1 that would be the operator norm and you see the operator norm is one but also the hilbert schmidt norm which is arising here as the frobenius norm so you, yeah if you want uh, you can recall this would be the trace uh, this is a uh, trace of P1 with P1 prime. Well, actually, it should be the square root of this non-negative trace. Oh, I'm lost now. Yeah, here. And you see that that happens to be all the same. And now uh, the important thing uh, that I really find uh, quite amazing is that such a rank one operator has a spreading representation, which is exactly the short term free transform. The only thing is, and actually I was always remind, remembering this, and if I don't remember the correct quotient, I'm just running this without the one over n, but if I see afterwards that I have to a uh, normalizing factor, then I can correct it. So you see, you have to remember, it's a very important situation, effect that the spreading representation of a rank one operator, so a rank one operator requires the analyzing window G1 in our case, and the synthesizing window. And you see also in the, uh, in this operator, the G1 is the one coming applied first. That's why it's why I call it G1. And it's coming with the conjugation. Therefore, it's plausible that in the short term Fourier transform, you say this is the G2, which has to be analyzed by taking scalar products where the G1 is going into conjugation. So that's plausible that you have to choose the opposite order here. Now, uh, Another thing which I find quite amazing or, or easy to demonstrate now and very useful to know is what happens if I do apply now to this rank one operator a conjugation uh, with the time frequency shift operator. So what does it mean? Um, I could either say uh, that maybe uh, Sorry. Uh, that's not good. Maybe maybe I leave it for now. But uh, in, the, in the script, I can do it. I could say I take the rank one operator and conjugate it with the matrix corresponding to this time frequency shift, or I just take what what is actually the same. I take a time frequency shift. So here I do not build the, the operator, but I apply to the signal G1 a time frequency shift where first the time and then the frequency shift is applied. And the same, the rotated version G2R is the same time frequency shift is applied to the G2. And so what I'm 
demonstrating here is I have a simple routine saying apply a time frequency shift conjugation with the parameters t time and frequency to the given operator and that's really with matrix multiplication or there's a more smart way of doing it because it's a very simple uh, conjugation we have seen the diagonal matrix conjugation already uh, the, the, the pure frequencies and we have studied the translation effect also which shifts everything down along the main diagonal so and so what i'm just demonstrating here that this time conjugation which is the theoretical thing is just applying it to these atoms okay so for me or for for later studies this will be important uh, for the generation of gabor multipliers because at the end we will saying well what is a gabor multiplier and this will be studied in much more detail it's a linear combination of projection operators on the individual gabor atoms so if you have a gabor frame in our standard case with 720 gabor building blocks you would like to project on each of them and maybe say well this building block is representing high frequencies at a certain time and i want to amplify those high frequencies because i don't know the little bird was singing a little bit too silent i want to emphasize it but the bass was a little bit too strong but only in a certain period so all these contributions uh, can be modified so this is really the audio engineer who is changing the loudness in different frequency bands at different times and so in the applications to GABA analysis the g1 uh, and the g2 will always be the same gauss atom and the time frequency parameters will be the points of our GABA lattice and then we can say well what we are doing when we are projecting on the different atoms is just we conjugate our rank one operator by these time frequency shift matrices now uh, one more thing that i have prepared for this uh, slide here of this demo is uh, i would like to recall to you that the involution is in, in a function space notation you go from f of x a function of x to f of minus x conjugate well in our setting of finite groups we would say we take the conjugation so you see i'm taking a trivial sequence one two three but multiplied with i so you get minus uh, on, for each of these things but then uh, instead of reading one two three four five and you should say this is a function sitting on the unit roots of order five so they are starting at omega to the power zero one two three and so what is the inverse you say it's zero or minus zero if you want minus one but minus one in a cyclic group is the same as four uh, so uh, that's the last component here and you see you're reading it backwards but you leave the first coordinate invariant so in the plot yeah maybe uh, maybe uh, we also do this command here plot num uh, the answer i'm not sure if it works now but uh, It should show you that we are uh, maybe the answer was something different. Mm -hmm. Ah, I see. Sorry, that, that, that's of course uh, nonsense. Uh, it, because it's purely imaginary, therefore it's plotted. Yeah, so I should not do it here. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, sh I was thinking too much of the unit roots of order, uh, and maybe uh, maybe I'm, I'm showing you the order in a different way by saying let's look, plot that the unit roots of order n, the conjugate of the unit roots of order five. 
So kind of that's the positions at which these values are taken. Now there is some aggregate. Yeah. Hopefully it works now. Yeah. It's a bit strange because I should put a remove the axis, but you see now it's going in the opposite direction is zero minus one minus two minus three minus four minus four is of course the same as plus one rotation by uh, 360 degree divided by five or so okay so what i want to demonstrate here is that uh, a way to understand convolution again so uh, Cyclic convolution can be done by either multiplying on the Fourier transform side or, and that's what I demonstrate uh, in the next uh, few block series, or I take uh, the second argument, flip it, and flipping means apply this involution, and then I take the shifted version. So to make it easy, I take row vectors of length five, complex vectors, and uh, just um, the first step is to verify that involution on the time side is just conjugation on the free transform side. So you see here, the second part of my comparison in 64 is take the free transform of my vector x5, then take the conjugation and then take it back. So it's clear that involution applied twice is the original one, it's isometric, everything is fine. Now, uh, if you have two vectors living on a cyclic group of order n, uh, you can say that I'm convolving them and it's cyclic convolution. Uh, and the cyclic convolution goes into the pointwise multiplication on the Fourier transform side. So the x, y, 5 is the convolution product in the sense of the cyclic group. And it's realized by taking on the Fourier transform the pointwise product dot star means pointwise product of these row vectors. And now I'm saying, well, choose any coordinate. I mean, what you see here, if k is three, you are getting two numbers. And also in order to show you that it's more flexible, you can take a new random vector, you can take another coordinate, maybe the second one. And I'm running this uh, section once more, I get different numbers, uh, but, uh, oh, it's, computing oops you see this is a demo effect ah i see yeah okay uh this was uh of course uh should be uh the same i left the three here and now everything is fine so what is done here well it's a scalar product between the first one and here we are saying, well, take the second one, which is the y5. Then you take an involution. And then you rotate. And, but you remember that in the convolution product, the kk is going from 0, 1, 2, 3. So if I say kk2, then I mean the uh, shift amount should be 1 only. And that's why I have to put this kk1. So this is kind of the classical notation of how to compute a, a, a convolution. Uh, I realized that actually one should compare it with multiplication of integers. That's how you learn to multiply at school. You're saying, well, I'm doing this uh, multiplication first with the hundreds, then the tens and so on, and write everything. And then you add over a column and that's actually what you're doing here, but uh, that would be too long to do it. So the only thing that I want to demonstrate that I thought, well, if I do this now in 1D, I should also do the demonstration in 2D. So there's the same procedure in 2D. Again, I take random complex now images, if you want. So it's five by five format. And I want to demonstrate again that the involution, so this same command, uh, it's recognizing the format of, of the input. 
And if it's 2D, it says involution, you just, it's just doing conjugation on the free transform side. So it, you either reshape uh, the order, you leave the first row, first column invariant, and you are inverting the rest, or you are saying, I'm just taking the conjugation at the level of the two-dimensional free transform, and then you go back. So you see there that that's perfectly fine. So what is the convolution product of 2D? Now, again, I would be, it would be nice to say that one-dimensional convolution is more or less multiplication of polynomials. Every at school you can learn how to multiply polynomials. You multiply out, you get a lot of terms, and then you collect all the coefficients which are uh, coming with, let's say, x to the third or x to the fifth. What can you say about 2D? Well, it's multiplication of polynomials of two variables. So uh, that's a different uh, thing that you could try. Think of inserting the information of a polynomial into a matrix. Then you would think, well, at the left upper corner, position 1, 1, we should put the constant term of the polynomial. In the first row, we should put the coefficients of x to the power 0, 1, 2, 3. And in the first column, you should put the powers of y. So what is, let's say, at position 2, 2? Well, this is where you have x to the power 1 multiplied with y to the power 1. And so you see that you can fill the information of a matrix uh, of, of, of a, any polynomial into a matrix. And then you can play around and say, well, what if I do convolution of the corresponding matrices representing now polynomials of degree of, of two variables? And you find out that this is exactly what you're doing. So it's a kind of two-dimensional Cauchy product. Again, I was choosing two random parameters in the range, so not too big. And I'm demonstrating that uh, here, uh, OK. Yeah, I was demonstrating uh, two things. I'm saying, well, I want to take uh, the, the convolution by applying the, the um, first one. So I have to convert it to a row vector. You see here. I have to make a row vector, but with conjugation, uh, pardon, without conjugation, that's the point. So it, uh, this xx5 double dot makes a column vector. The transpose changes from column to row vector without conjugation, whereas the second guy, which is my yy6, has to be taken in the conjugate way, but now as a column vector. So how was I doing this? Well, you in, take the involution of the second convolution factor. This is y, y5, involution. And then you're doing a rotation. But now we have a rotation in terms of rows and columns. And then uh, that's a bit uh, too cumbersome now. I was just thinking, well, the second component is the vertical component. Uh, so it's row wise. So that's why we put it first. And then uh, I wasn't sure, is this in the convolution product now with this standard modification of the parameter by plus one? Should I put k1 in the first position or k2 in the first position? And you see the second one is giving the right value, whereas the first one was having the, the wrong. So this is, again, a demonstration that even on this cyclic group, no, the product of cyclic groups of order five, you have the same thing, you can convolve two elements, two functions, and I would say you can convolve a function on the group with a measure on the group, and they are the same in a discrete finite setting, by applying to the first one a time frequency, a flip operator, and then a, a, a translation in the sense of the group, and then here it's a rotation by rows and column. So, uh, I think it's a good moment to take a, a step back and uh, stop the recording now with this particular routine. So, uh...